Do we leave that one there for Jack, huh? Thank you. Yes. Da -da, yes. Okay. Good that you and Jack got to read. Yeah. I like I'm it. Missing. I love that one that night, and I love it again. New York a week before that saying, oh, I missed my chance to read. Try to write some truth. Da -da. Okay, so you asked me what was the what was the big thing that happened. So like last last week, I went to my 60th high school reunion. <laughs> that was a big deal to me. I saw people I hadn't seen since high school in 60 years and shit. It was like very interesting. So meanwhile, thinking about it all, I'm feeling nostalgic. So I'm gonna do this po these two poems. These two poems are from my book. I didn't come here to tap dance. This one is called um, Funny Thing Is. I never thought much about growing old. Didn't realize that I was until in a group discussion with young poets. I mentioned that I went to high school and college in the Jim Crow South before integration. We actually had teachers that cared. We didn't wear jeans to school. It just wasn't allowed. We never thought it was uncool. In fact, we birthed the cool. Male teachers wore suits and ties. Women teachers wore skirts and dresses. You could tell the teachers from the students. And people dressed up when they went to church. In fact, church was like a fashion show. Everyone wore their best. I never argued with dad about whether or not I could use the car. We didn't have a car. In fact, I remember before Rosa Parks, we rode in the back of the bus. We debated much more serious issues like integrating schools 
But the fact that I never really wanted to go to school with white people, it wasn't that I disliked them. It's just that all of my friends were black and that they were foreign to me. None lived in my neighborhood. Going in their neighborhood could get your ass kicked and vice versa. Besides, my high school marching band was the best in the state. We didn't play Sousa. We rocked the hits like hit the road with Jack and danced the wobble and a jerk. I grew up on Saturday night doo-wop and Sunday morning gospel. I learned harmony beneath the streetlights. We sang songs like in the still of the night. After graduation, we didn't try to dodge the draft. It would have been an embarrassment to the family. Besides, my mom worked as a secretary for the government. It was one of the better jobs for colored people, although the water fountains and restrooms were still segregated. I walked picket lines in the 60s. My dad was a plaintiff in the Brown versus Board of Education suit in Virginia. He got fired from his job for it. We integrated theaters, stores, lunch counters, and churches too. Some white kids joined in, but they were mostly into peace and love. We grew into black power. Stokely Carmichael became Kwame Torre. Leroy Jones became Imamu Amiri Baraka. I became Ngoma. I was an infantryman in Vietnam long before hip hop. We wore Afros and Converse before Adidas shell tops. I told you, me and Miles, we birthed the cool. After Nam, heroin was king. Panthers and Simbas owned the night until COINTELPRO. Fred Hampton and Bobby Hutton lay in their graves, soldiers coming home in body bags. Funny thing is, I never thought I'd live long enough to grow old. <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> so then I moved from Virginia to New York, and this is called uh, Up South. She says, write a poem about being a poet from New York. I'm thinking, mm, that could be hard. See, to begin with, I've lived here since 79, but I'm not from New York. I'm from Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. I followed the North Star like a runaway slave searching for freedom, trying to get away from picket lines and Klan signs, only to find Ku Klux killer cops hiding behind badges instead of sheets. Now, don't get me wrong. I love New York. During my college days, all of my boys bit from the Big Apple. I hung out with them because they were the coolest, but they're all gone now. So I pour a sip for Lou Wheeler and Leslie Scott. I take my little money from a summer job at Menacing to buy Italian knits, shark skin pants, and Playboy shoes with the thick rubber soles from McCready and Schreiber. I wouldn't tell anyone where I was really from. All the flyest girls like brothers from New York, and I wanted to be cool like that. My boys introduced me to Black Power, Black Muslims, Black Nationalists, Black Panthers, and Black Poetry. Imamu Amiri Baraka, as he was called then. Haki Matabuti, a.k.a. Don L. Lee, Carolyn Rogers, Askia Muhammad Torre, and the last poets. Of course, with the exception of some of the last poets, none of them were from New York anyway, but it didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be like them. I'd never heard talk like that before. I was hooked, and poetry was my drug of choice. Malcolm's murder triggered the Black arts movement. The seeds was planted, watered, and nurtured at all the poetry spots, the Spirit House in Newark, the East and Uhuru Sasa Shule in Brooklyn, the African Poetry Theater in Queens, and the National Black Theater in Harlem. But then you wanted to know about the poetry. Thing is, I never called myself a poet. Jelly or grill might be a better description. Since I rock anything with a string, I can plus I can sing. Some call me Dr. Rockefiddle, the godfather of spoken word. You better ask somebody if you haven't heard. Actually, I write a lot too. You might say I'm just a pissed off brother with a pen. One of my friends reminded me, America is a place where the past always looks like the future. But these twisted I want to be hip hoppers and Ku Klux Killer cops think niggas come in all colors. So I still do protests and die-ins because in this atmosphere, I can't breathe. And New York just seemed like up south to me. Okay. Like it is, in your mouth. Going back to the past. I mean, you know, before Rosa Parks, and then ending up, as you say, like in current day New York. That's a nice way to do it. You know, the continuity of that that oral history and all. Very, very good. Thank you. I can't hear all you're saying, Mo. You're breaking up. Oh, okay. Well, what I was.
was saying was, I, that was excellent. How you, in that poem, uh, mentioned going back to a time before Rosa Parks. Yeah. You understand, move on the bus. Yeah. He, in New York City, I can't breathe. And I'm up south. And it, it, it has a continuous line from the poem that doesn't make leaps that I have to fill in with research or anything like that. Okay. And that's what I appreciate. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to come back to Paris now, and we're going to bring on Jack Cooper. And so, Jack, you're up. Okay. <clears throat> this is called uh, Hunger. I know now that watching you eat was what I once loved about my mother. The necessity of it, the intensity of it, the unacknowledged pleasure. Everything that made reality human. So much in my life, my tender experience, places things in doubt. And here was proof, above all sciences, that to be, to exist, was hunger and could be satisfied. Beauty was to perceive, to see that whatever else truth could be, this was fact. Thank you. Essentials. Right. Some title for that I call the essentials. I, I I didn't get it. I said for a, a subtitle for that poem I would call the essentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful yeah. thing. Hunger. Hunger. Yeah. Okay. Number or two. eat your vegetables. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an old favorite of mine. It's called a post-mortem. I used to dream myself everywhere. I once fucked the world. My life doubled as a movie set. A long shot set on cranes and tracked high overhead. The view over the top tip of the flame, perspective on fire, and no hand to douse it. Incendiary! Incendiary! I was the late 20th incendiary man. Stand by me, because I can't stand myself now. Well, we hope that mood will pass. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to ask, how do Martin and Caroline wish to present in the second round? I think we're going to continue the same way we did before. Huh. All right. Caroline, which one should we start with? Um, well, maybe beginning with desk and down, then droplets. Okay. okay. Hmm. So the first one is called Dusk and Dawn. Umber of garish maple leaves spiral down like paper airplanes thrown by laughing children roosting in the branches. Le crépuscule et l'aube, le chêne ambré et les feuilles d'érable criardes descendent en spirale comme des avions en papier lancés par des enfants rieurs perchés dans les branches. I bury my feet in the auburn carpet as I sink my toes into the sand. My fingers turn white. The blood flows black, back into the deep reserve. J'enfouis mes pieds dans le tapis Auburn, comme j'enfonce mes orteils dans le sable. 
mes doigts deviennent blancs, le sang reflue dans la réserve profonde. A murmuration bickers about which finger to perch on. Some starlings pick through my hair. Une murmuration se chamaille pour savoir sur quel doigt se percher. Des étourneaux picorent dans mes cheveux. Chirp, chirp, while I sleep, while I fall asleep, warm in the humus, the future buds prepare themselves on the branches. Pépier, pépier, tandis que je m'endors au chaud dans l'humus, les futurs bourgeons se préparent sur les branches. Icy fingers reach down to me, and I burrow deeper, hiding my heart from their shriveling grasp. Flakes of compassion wrap me with their silent blanket. Des doigts glacés se tendent vers moi, et je m'enfonce plus profondément, cachant mon cœur de leur prise ratatinée. Des flocons de compassion m'enveloppent de leur couette silencieuse. The blood pooled in the root reservoir promises to return and release the origami butterfly wings hidden in the buds. Le sang accumulé dans la racine réservoir promet de revenir et de libérer les ailes de papillons en origami cachées dans les bourgeons. Nestled in their cocoons, they dream of frolicking in the windy streams of spring when the children, woken by the alarm clock of the sun, will toss them back up to the pointillistic oak and maple branches. Blottis dans leurs cocons, ils rêvent de s'ébattre dans les coulées venteuses du printemps, quand les enfants, réveillés par le réveil du soleil, les relèveront vers les branches pointillistes des chênes et des érables. Oh, yeah. yeah. Number two. <clears throat> Droplets. If letters are atoms and words are molecules, are haikus drops of water? Mm. Gouttelettes. Mm, okay. Si les lettres sont des atomes et les mots sont des molécules, les haikus sont-ils des gouttelettes d'eau? Fluid from which the world is born and dissolves in a haiku. How many mountains? In a perfect round of pea in the snow, thousands. Fluide d'où naît et se dissout le monde. En un haiku, combien de montagnes? En un rond parfait de pipi dans la neige, des milliers. How many dancing fleas fill a wine glass? To what rhythm does steam rise from a weary horse? Can we measure the volume of words? Ah, euh, combien de puces dansantes remplissent un verre à vin? À quel rythme la vapeur s'élève-t-elle d'un cheval fatigué? Peut-on mesurer la maîtrise des mots? Does a kiss sound the same in one country or another? Is a sonata the same on the way out and on the way in? How many births of cells in my body has this poem accompanied? Un bisou sonne-t-il pareil dans un pays ou dans un autre? Une sonate est-elle la même à l'aller et au retour? Combien de naissances de cellules de mon corps ce poème a-t-il accompagné? Yet births are but a rearrangement of atoms. In my body, there are atoms of Sappho and Democ Democritus. In this poem, letters from Dion and Labbé. Mais les naissances ne sont qu'un réarrangement d'atomes. Dans mon corps, il y a des atomes de Sappho et de Démocrite. Dans ce poème, des lettres de Villon et de Labbé. Plant dancing on the side of a volcano, a shark waking up in the ocean's calm, and compost fertilize 
my silence. Une plante dansant sur le flanc d'un volcan. Un requin qui se réveille dans le calme de l'océan et le compost fertilise mon silence. Bravo, bravo, you guys. Well, ma making biology into poetry so fascinating. I mean, I was listening going, yeah, imagine, imagine. To cite what I said earlier, that's a piece of work you two together that has a momentum that you know and, you know, and, yeah can you imagine the volume of words uh, it, it's a haiku a drop of water that's all imaginable and, and worth thinking about mm -hmm. uh, thank you yeah it's really sublime i i have only one fact check question mm -hmm. Do sharks really sleep? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I think very, they do, very actually. slow. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there's also, this is referring to the, you know, common, I don't know if it's a myth or if it's a fact that sharks have to keep swimming to breathe, right? To, because mm. yes. so th th that's implicitly referring to that as well. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> the questions that need to be resolved, investigated, and more, and, and need to swirl around, in my case, in, in my limited imagination, on this biology in the deep world. Yeah. Not only with other creatures, but coexistence with other elements mm. yeah yeah shark is a bit like a bad dream you know it's um, mm -hmm. always there ready to bite <laughs> but they are not they are very very quiet they don't the it's just a legend they are not eating a lot i think uh, a shark just eat two 200 grams a day mm -hmm. they don't eat a lot right it's very maybe not 200 grams um i sh um i'll check it okay and i'll answer uh, the next time <laughs> either way in my dream uh -huh. <laughs> they eat all they can <laughs> oh. i i i would um i'm most afraid about um sea crocodile Ah yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they can run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Catch me on the sand. <laughs> you have rekindled my imagination because a couple months ago I installed <laughs> a, a tank full of tropical fish. <laughs> Once a day, uh, I listen to what I consider profoundly moving music. Can be jazz, symphonic, and then I stare into the fish tank and watch the graceful aqua choreography of my little fish. And at night, I, I say good night to them. And I wonder as they sit there quietly, the black mollies in particular, are you sleepy? Not a movement. They just hmm. sit at the bottom of the tank. So. You find this out. Let me know about other fish as well. Do they sleep? I I put some kind of an answer in the in the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Right. From from the, from the general to the specific. That's right. Sharks and black bottles. Yeah, and and mainly in the Pacific, right? Truly <laughs> <laughs> inclusive, everyone. We are without hurting anyone's feelings. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, now we are going to go back to Atlanta. In the PA. Please, you are on. Pablo, you are on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I've got two odes to wrap things up. The first is an ode to all the poets of the world, which includes the Angora poets, of course. It's titled Poetry Lane. This one's to you. 
Take me down that poetry lane where complex thoughts and emotions reign. Take me. Tease me with your radical wit and wordsmithery, riffing rhymes through torrid twists and tacit turns of whim and satire. Tease me. Seduce me with copious sips from your cup of cryptic allegory, laced like lyrical jello shots for literate minds. Seduce me. Rock me to the beat of shackle free verse, channeling countercultural cues from Cassidy and Etsu to Amiri Baraka and Jack. Kerouac, rock me, baby, rock me. Shock me with lucid volts of eccentricity sourced from every storm and saga and scandal in your life. Shock me, baby, shock me. Make me yearn for more of your creative core and essence cowering shells, virtual and real, for another surreal rendezvous with a poignant piece of you, Angora poets, down your poetry lane. Ayo. Okay, thank you. So that's- Thank you. That's, thank you, you're welcome. So that's Poetry Lane. And then the second piece is an ode to a British Guyanese actress by the name of Letitia Wright. And those of you who may not know her, she starred as the scientist in uh, Wakanda Forever. Her name was Shuri in that role. Um, so this is Letitia. Ode to Letitia Wright. Badly. Gifted, bold, bright. An actress trained and talented, it's plain to see. A star on the big screen, a Black Panther with grace and humility. She broke out the Chantel, earned critical acclaim of Nish, then shocked the world of Shuri, genius inventor and scientist, Wakanda. Wise beyond her years, godly, gentle, and gifted. She speaks from the heart, leaving spirits uplifted. She's got the loot to rock Prada and Fendi, but prefers the casual swag of Nikes and the shoulder bag. Now she's a Guyanese girl, don't get it twisted. She may sound British to you, but she is Guyanese true and true. In fact, as we would say, she is GT true and true. Check this. She still know for talk Creolese if you hear she buy. And she loves she tennis roll with cheese, she chicken foot, and she metai. She's a pillar of strength, though slight in stature. She's grounded in faith. She is a force of nature. She cares, she dares, she's bold, she's bright. Letitia, 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 right. Godly, gifted, bold, bright. Letitia, 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 right. Ayo. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm trying to put a face to Letitia Wright in Wakanda. Yeah, she is the 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 slim, dark, uh, very very tiny, very uh, frail, dark skin. She was the scientist to the star of the movie. She was the the funny kind of genius little girl with a with a short haircut. You know, kind of a yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome.
as they say when I, they, t- they taught me in Latin America, say, say his name, say her name, and she lives. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's down to me, and I'm the last one, and uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna read you uh, two quick pieces. One of them's from my screen again, and uh, let's just call it. Mo, try to stay close to the screen. I I will try to do that. Sorry about that. And next, I will buy uh, new uh, headphones so that this doesn't, uh, I don't do this again. Okay. Uh, Here's a piece that uh, proves poetic. Uh, As I was in the States for one month, one of my hosts had the television on from morning till night. Morning till night. And it, it it overwhelmed me more than in past visits because of the presidential race primarily and uh, the accusations uh, from against both parties, both candidates, where nothing was ever really uh, investigated to a conclusion. Just a whole lot of hyperbole one another. So, and... Uh, my host was saying, see, now you know, now you know. And I went, what do I know? And I just wrote, the USA, a presidential race. They're doing the long haul months and months in advance. After spending a month inside, I went to two parties. It seemed to reflect on another. The only difference is a change in suit color. Authoritarian Democrats won't hold presidential primary debates. Oh, the GOP, the Trump charade, and other GOP contenders, Herbert Hoover clones. Billions and billions for Ukraine, a pittance for East Palestine, Ohio. The left and liberals, their leader, sheeple, supporters of mass censorship and deplatforming, social media sites in conclusion, speeches, 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 rally after rally, both sides boasting, guardians of democracy, USA, leader of the free world, Hmm. dismantling both quality of life continues to decline. This one is not so original. It's just an homage to a composer and a poet, a French poet, uh, and my feelings on that. It's our calling, like right on time, autumn is arrived. I'm singing the French original of Autumn Leaves, Les Feuilles Mort, composed by Joseph Kozma in 1945, and lyrics, oh, those lyrics, by poet Jacques Prévert. The falling leaves drift by the window, the autumn leaves of red and gold. I see your lips, the summer kisses, the sunburned hands I used to hold. That that's my homage. Yeah. Great French poets turned into lyricists recorded into song. 
the great contributions by these French, the, these French artists over time. Yes. Okay. Well, there we are. I tell you, I didn't take notes tonight, but I could have done like a, a large number. Can we weigh the what was it? The volume of words? I could have quoted so many profound things said tonight. That's mm -hmm. how much I was involved, enveloped in what you all were expressing. So I want to thank you so much for that. Mm. I saw a photo uh, recently of uh, Jacques Prévert's uh, house in uh, somewhere on the Côte d'Azur. Okay. He's not in somewhere in the Côte uh, Well, uh, uh, um, is it on de, de là où il est enterré? I'm not sure. He is. Uh, he's buried in in the in at the point of the Cotentin in Normandy. Ah, ok. Yeah. Tout au bout du Cotentin, vers, euh, vers Cherbourg, dans ce coin-là, dans un petit village, un tout petit, tout petit. Yeah. I think it was it was during the during the Second World War that he lived there with his wife. Um, I don't yeah. remember, but um, the the thing sure is that they are buried next to well the, the two best friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's they correct. have the two graves, and I thought it was so touching. Because uh, Alexander Trauner, I think he lost uh, most of his family during the World War because he was mm. Jew. And uh, so he's got a, a hot family forever. And yeah. it's, it's very, yeah. Mm. But, uh, wow. Alexander Trauner was uh, one of the biggest um, the chief decorator in cinema. He made uh, the decor uh, of the oh, one of the Billy Wilder movie, uh, La Garçonnière in French, The Apartment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He made the, the, the decor and uh, also Les Enfants du Paradis. Really? Okay. Yes. I know that one. Yeah. And uh, he was, uh, mm. he was uh, working under, um, well, it was during the occupation, mm. and they hide him. And yes. the, the house has had two doors for he can escape. Oh, right. yeah. And uh, it's a big The de Paris was made during the occupation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was made in Marseille, I think. Well, well in the Côte d'Azur. <laughs> it was in south of France. And uh, it's a very beautiful story if you want to, mm. to, to look uh, and find it. It's a uh, <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. then, let, let me add some homage to someone else who contributed very much to the arts and in the fight for freedom in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. That is Hedy Lamar. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Right. Hedy, I posted her on Facebook because I bought a biography, a hardback biography of her in a newsstand for 10 euros. Hardback. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so here's some info. Hedy Lamar, original name, Hedvig Eva Maria, born November 9, 1913, Vienna, Austria, died January 19, 2000, near Orlando, Florida. Austrian born, American film star who was often typecast as a Marketing femme fatale. Years after her screen career ended, she achieved recognition in the world of science as a noted inventor of radio communication. Yeah, yeah. That's... Science contributions, among many, include helping to jam Nazi radio and her wave physics led like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Mm. This is a good read in French. Mm -hmm. Hedy. Hedy Lamar. Hedy Lamar, yeah. <laughs> he was actually Czech. Yeah. 
Yeah, me too. Okay, Rorschach. Goodbye. Bye, Rorschach. Bye. Thank Bye, you. David. It was nice to see you. Mm. Oh, and Glad to see you back home. Bye. Yeah, Bye. good to see you Bye. all again. And thanks for such a very provocative, compelling uh, reading by the seven of us. Thank you.